Hello, everyone. Uh, so we have chapter 23 here today, which is on electromagnetic waves. So we're going to talk about what is electromagnetic waves, so what are electromagnetic waves, and how they're related to uh, light, and how can we use that uh, concept of electromagnetic waves to relate electricity and magnetism together in what we call Maxwell's equations. So Maxwell basically was able to give us, you know, some of this concept in a for, you know, formulaic way where those formulas are a little bit too advanced for this class, but we should be able to at least see some of the wave properties of this electromagnetic wave. And we're gonna talk about some of those properties, uh, the energy associated with those waves, and look at in terms of how that can be used to uh, basically understand the next few chapters of of this class, which is on um, basically optics. All right, so we have James Clerk Maxwell, who was, um, you can think of like father of electromagnetism, because even though he took some of the previous discoveries, he was able to put them in such a way that he unified all of them, uh, modified some of them, and put it in such a way that you can pretty much describe everything electric and magnetic phenomena using those equations. All right, so also one of the important things he, he did was, you can see right in 1865, he showed that an electromagnetic disturbance, which is basically an electromagnetic wave, should propagate in free space with a speed equal to that of light. That means he was able to calculate the speed of electromagnetic wave in vacuum in free space, and the the value for the you know the speed of the electromagnetic wave happened to be exactly same as that was for speed of light. And they knew what speed of light in vacuum was. They just didn't know what light was. They didn't understand what light is, how to produce light. Uh, let's say theoretically, but he put together you know set of equations. He used them to calculate the speed of the electromagnetic wave. And then he realized that electromagnetic wave and light are the same thing. So that means light is just an electromagnetic wave. And we knew that light is a wave because in 1800s, early 1800s, there were some experiments to you know, uh, verify without doubt that light actually was a wave. And you know, what type of wave? Well, it is electromagnetic wave, and it's electromagnetic wave means that it's electric and magnetic fields, you know, reinforcing each other, which we'll see in a little bit. All right, so, so you can see, right, according to Maxwell's equation, an accelerating electric charge must produce electromagnetic waves. For example, these power lines that you see, right, carry a strong alternating current. Remember, the uh, most of the electricity that we use in our, our household is not DC, but AC. The batteries are DC, but everything in the household are basically operating at the alternating current, alternating voltage, um, basically in AC circuits. So power lines carry a strong alternating current, which means that a substantial amount of charge is accelerating back and forth and generating electromagnetic waves. So these waves can produce a buzzing sound from your car radio when you drive nearby, you know, to those lines. All right. Now, what is electromagnetic waves? So, and uh, what are the, since we understand that it's, you know, it's light, um, how then we can look at in terms of the entire electromagnetic spectrum? Because electromagnetic spectrum or electromagnetic waves are a lot more complicated than just, you know, what we see around us. Because as you can see over here, uh, the electromagnetic waves, um, include the portion of light that we can see that our eyes are sensitive to. But there is also a large, you know, range of different, let's say what we call, you know, you can think like colors, right? Because colors as we see them, nothing but, you know, um, electromagnetic waves at different frequencies or wavelengths, you can think like this. So for example, here you have red, Red is when the light is oscillating at 700 nanometer wavelength. And here's violet or blue, which is roughly 400 nanometers. That means you can see, right, 
so the wavelength kind of you know uh, increasing in this direction that means violet has lower wavelength uh, than or shorter wavelength than red that means you know in terms of the wavelength we go from you know blue or violet to red increasing our wavelength um, the frequencies on the other hand go other way around that means the frequencies increases in opposite direction so frequency of red is less than frequency so frequency of red is less than frequency of violet where wavelength of red is greater than wavelength of violet and when different type of frequency basically enter our eyes right we get then different you know color because our eyes sensitive to the frequency of the of the light and different frequency let's say uh, give you different color but there are obviously in, in this electromagnetic spectrum there are frequencies that somewhere over here and that we can see and there are other ones that we can see there is above that so that means our eyes are only sensitive to some of the range or let's say range that we can see and you can see right it's technically a very tiny range that we can actually see so now in terms of this spectrum you can see then we have radio waves and we have microwaves and we have infrared so those are the wavelengths or frequencies before red color so that's why infrared so this means those are very large wavelengths larger than our visible you know light and which means also a lower frequency so that means low you know energy associated with that then after you know our visible spectrum there's ultraviolet which has a lower frequency a higher frequency but lower wavelength and then there are gamma rays and x-rays right x-rays gamma rays those are you know much much smaller wavelength but much much higher frequencies and generally one of the things we have here is that energy is associated in the waves proportional to its frequency so x-rays and gamma rays have much much higher frequency and that means they are they have much much higher um you know energy associated with that so gamma rays are very dangerous x-rays are you know mildly dangerous and if you get exposed to x-ray for a short period of time there could be some medical benefits but you know you don't want to let's say do that every week or something like that gamma rays you know are extremely dangerous if you're exposed to gamma rays for you know a couple of hours let's say that can be pretty much fatal all right so obviously you know one of the things we're going to be concentrating on visible light and as you could see as small as it is you know that's the one that we are sensitive to or our eyes are sensitive to so you don't have to kind of memorize but approximately let's say know the values of the uh, different colors so let's say violet is has a range between 380 to 450 then you can see right there comes blue and green then yellow orange then red so in a way our range here is 380 to roughly 750 nanometers remember nano stands for 10 to the negative 9 that means they are very small right very short wavelengths and what we have here is this wavelength values you can think of these are in you know let's say in air or in vacuum uh, because one of the things we're going to see later on is that these wavelength values can actually change so depending if it's in different medium but one of the things we have here is this value is given as you know wavelengths of the visible spectrum um, you know in air or in vacuum <clears throat> again you don't have to memorize but roughly have an idea right so let's say if, if I give you that there's a wavelength of 500 nanometers what is 500 nanometers when it falls into this range that means it's the green color okay so and so on and so forth so kind of more or less understand where in that uh, let's say range the frequency will give you a type of color basically all right so um there are actually you know insects and birds and things like that that can see ultraviolet that humans cannot so you can see right left hand photo shows how black-eyed susan look to us 
So this is how it looks to us, right? And then on the right hand photo, which we can do as a false color taken with an ultraviolet sensitive camera, shows how this same flower appears to bees that pollinate them. You can see, right, it's completely different. Now, uh, not the prominent central spot that is invisible to humans. So this spot, right, is basically invisible to us, but you know, bees can see that. All right, so let's look, look at then electromagnetic wave uh, that, <clears throat> let's say, you know, Maxwell kind of, you know, used to discover that electromagnetic wave is a light. So to, you know, to understand how the wave, you know, electromagnetic wave, right, is propagating, we need to understand that electromagnetic wave, just like we talked about in the previous chapter, uh, electro electric waves or electric, you know, fields can induce magnetic fields, right? The, the electricity can generate magnetic field. And then Faraday's law tells us that, you know, changing magnetic field can induce electricity or ele induce electric field. That means you have, you can have it in a region where there's a electric field and magnetic field like that. And what they do here is they constantly change. As the electric field is changing, there's a, you know, magnetic field that is generated and also changing. And as magnetic field is changing, electric field is changing. So that's kind of what we have. That means you have this constantly changing electric fields and magnetic fields that reinforce each other. And the you know, wave is then propagating, let's say in a positive X direction. So you can see, right? So let's say the electric field, you know, oscillates up and down in a, you know, let's say in a, X, in a Y direction. So then for example, then the magnetic field oscillates in a, extra, uh, sorry, in the Z direction. So that means as they're oscillating in that direction, so let's say here's a magnetic field and here's the electric field, right? So there, as they oscillate, the system, right, is moving in this X direction, okay? So we should be able to, you know, there's a diagram that, you know, more or less you can see in terms of how these waves are kind of like propagating, okay? So let's say, let me kind of do it for, so let's say if I'm talking about, you know, electric field. So the electric field then decreases, right? So let's say, or, or well, what happens here? Let me kind of like start over. So let's say if I'm doing electric field, so let me draw my uh, coordinate system first. So this is y axis, this is z axis, and this is x axis. So let's say here's the electric field. And here's the magnetic field. Okay. Now, what happens here is as electric field now, let's say, decreases, so is magnetic field. Again, as electric field decreases, so is magnetic field because change in one changes the other. And let's say here's that. Here's the other one. And then let's say then becomes like this and like that and like that, right? So you can see which then in order changes magnetic field like this. Now, if I then use this sort of like, let's say, so you can see, right? If I use it, you can see then this is what we get here, and this is what we get over there. So you can see, right, they are sinusoidal wave-like. And then what it does, it then basically makes the wave itself propagate in this, you know, X direction, okay? So every point <coughs> to, the <coughs> to the left of this plane, there are, <coughs> excuse me, there are uniform electric field, magnetic field as shown. And what we have here is this, this line here is the wave front, which are basically, you can see, right, the crests, right? So they're representing the, and the plane, right? Representing the crest of those waves. And you can see then basically you can have that wave front, right? The plane wave front where the crests are propagating, you know, in X direction with the speed C. All right. So Maxwell's equation implied that in electromagnetic wave, both the electric and magnetic fields are perpendicular to the direction of propagation. 
and they're perpendicular to each other. In an electromagnetic wave, there is a definite ratio between the magnitudes of the electric and magnetic fields. That means you can always look at the ratio that represents, you know, the electric and magnetic fields. And that ratio here is E equals C times B, or C, speed of light in vacuum, equals a ratio of E over B, okay? So this ratio, you can always use to see that, you know, electric field as a function of time, divided by magnetic field as a function of time, at any instant, when you look at the electric field and its corresponding magnetic field, you take the ratio of them, you're gonna get a speed of light in vacuum. And remember, unlike mechanical waves, uh, electromagnetic waves require no medium. In fact, they can travel in vacuum with definite and unchanging speed. That means the C, C that speed of light in vacuum is constant and it doesn't require medium like sound, which requires you know, air molecules or string wave, which requires a string or water wave, which requires water, right? Well, electromagnetic wave, you know, basically goes back and forth, right? Uh, or, or just, you know, generated because of the back and forth uh, change in electric and magnetic fields, which reinforce each other. And after putting everything together, let's say, what Maxwell realized is to calculate the speed of the electromagnetic waves in vacuum, he ended up just deriving this equation, which basically only depends on the you know, electric constant and magnetic constant. Remember, epsilon naught and mu naught. Calculate this guy, you get three times 10 to the eight meter per second. And nothing else is moving at that three times 10 to the eight meter per second, but light. That means they have to be related to one another because there's nothing else even remotely close having that speed of three times to the eight meter per second. And they already knew about, you know, the speed of light in vacuum. There were experiments already done, you know, um, decades ago that, you know, showed the light is actually moving at that speed. So then he concluded that light has to be, light has to be, um, you know, same as electromagnetic wave. Because in that case, a lot of things can be then explained. Okay. So the way it generally goes is, it's one of those right-hand rules. So if you have, uh, your fingers in the direction of electric field and you curl in the direction of magnetic field, your thumb basically gives you the direction of the speed of that wave, electromagnetic wave. That means what we have here is the direction is, you know, you can think like it's a vector product. So that means, you know, we don't really do this in this class, but what we have is a C here is proportional is to the electric field when we say vector product is like E cross B. So it's kind of like a vector product where we use you know, that means it's E, B, sine, theta. So let's say it is proportional. And we've got proportional because there is also a, a constant. So when you do that, there's also a constant, which we're gonna see in a little bit. So electromagnetic waves produced by an oscillating point charge. Remember, there's always any type of, you know, wave requires a source. So let's say um, a light has a sun as a source, or it can be have a light bulb as a source. But then when it's moving, right, it doesn't need any medium. It can propagate in empty space or vacuum. That's why we can see the sun because the light from the sun reaches us, you know, and it has to travel through free space, right, through a vacuum. Same thing is here. So you can think of like, let's say, when there's a source, these waves are propagating like this in every direction, okay? Propagating like that in every direction. They have distinct wavelength, distinct frequencies, right? But you know, they can then, uh, you know, have, let's say the same source can generate many different type of, you know, frequencies, you know, depending on, let's say, if its oscillation is changing. So, um, you can see, right, if we restrict our observation to a relatively small region, so let's say just this region over there, um, then at a sufficiently great distance from the source, even these waves are well approximated by plane waves. The idea for this one is, so let's say if you have a source, See, they kind of go like this, right? Oh, that was bad. So um, let me try this again. So if this is a source, see the waves kind of go like this. And a wave, this one goes like that. That means this one moving in this direction, this one moving in this direction. And let's say this one moving like this, right? So they kind of uh, 
you know, deviate, right? So they kind of like um, diverge from one another. But if you wait a really long time, right? So let's say uh, wait and measure something over here, those waves then more or less are going parallel to one another. So we can kind of approximate as them to be plane waves. All right, so hopefully these equations are not, you know, um, let's say completely new for you guys. These are the equations that we had for the electro, you know, for the waves. So for the traveling waves, um, and we studied this in physics six. So remember, let's say what we did here was y x comma t was equal to the amplitude, then sine of, and then what we had here is that it was two pi over the period times time minus two pi over the wave number times x. This was the general equation that we used for the traveling waves, where t is the period, uh, and k here is a wave number. Okay, so several things we can do from here is if you have the period, you can calculate the frequency, which is one over the period, or you can calculate angular frequency, which is two pi over the period. Also, if we have then the k, which is the wave number, then we can calculate the wavelength because this is, you know, uh, 2 pi over the, you know, over the k, like that. Okay. That means, in a way, I can relate this period to the omega and wavelength to the wave number, and um, we can then relate those things, right? So for example, how it is better to, for me to write it like this, so you can see that relationship. So K is equal to two pi over wavelength, even though wavelength is also two pi over the omega. But let's say here, uh, I made a mistake, let me correct this. So this is actually not uh, K num, this is the, this is the wavelength. So general equation like two pi over the period times t minus two pi over the wavelength times x. And then two pi over the wavelength is replaced with the wave number, two pi over the period replaced with the period, and then we get this equation. So this represents that this is the amplitude. So this is the amplitude of electric field, right? And then what we get here is, so this is angular frequency and this is the wave number. So that means we have exactly same thing for electric and magnetic fields because there are two fields, two waves, right? And those fields moving as waves, so there is equation for electric field and equation for magnetic field. And as I mentioned, right, so you can find then the speed of light by taking the electric field or magnetic field. This is time, you know, this, this, is, this is like, let's say, this guy versus this guy at any instant. Or I can do the same thing in terms of the amplitudes, E max over B max, that also works. Or I can, you know, calculate this using the good old, you know, equation for the speed, if you remember, and that was wavelength times frequency. We can also use that equation, okay? Now, now that we have that, see, I can do this. So speed is equals to wavelength times frequency, but remember, uh, what I have here is the frequency is one over the period, so I can also do wavelength over the period. That also can give me the speed of light in vacuum. Also, since, um, you know, period related to omega and the wavelength related to the wave number, this can also rearrange to become omega over k. That means those, all of those equations basically can be used to find the speed of light in vacuum. And for example, this guy here relates the you know, amplitude of the electric and magnetic fields to the speed of light. Okay. Now, these are just other equations for the um, speed of electromagnetic waves in you know, dielectric, for example, and things like that. But you know, these are just for your information type of equation. We don't really use them you know, at, at all in, 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 this, in this class. Um, because we have already, as I showed you in the previous slides, there were like four or five different ways already that we can find, the, uh, let's say, the speed of light in vacuum. Now, one thing can, that's going to be very important is 
understanding you know the fact that sometimes the light can actually change its speed and it happens when the light goes from air or vacuum which we assume that the light has the same speed in air as in vacuum so when it goes from air or vacuum to a different medium like i don't know like water like glass right they actually you know change the speed those electromagnetic waves right that you know electric magnetic fields they slow down when they go into more dense material. That means one thing we have here is <clears throat> the equation that tells you that, okay, so take the speed of light in vacuum. It's a constant, right? And then divide it by the, you know, velocity in this medium. So some medium um, that we consider, let's say water, right? Then what we get here is, so let's say put here is W for water. Then this ratio, is a unitless number and it's going to give us a number that we call index of refraction and we use n for that so lowercase n is for index of refraction that means this equation works for any type of medium so for example so this is c divided by v at some medium and let's say i'm considering this medium air or let's say vacuum right so this is vacuum well what is speed uh, of speed of light in vacuum well, speed of light in vacuum is also C, so C over C, and I get 1. That means N for vacuum is equals to 1, exactly 1, like 1.000 whatever. So it's exactly 1. Well, how about, how about for air? Well, for air will be C divided by velocity of light in air. Well, if I do that, I get this, 1.003, 0003. Well, that means you can see, right, it's very close to vacuum. So, and if I use, you know, let's say two decimal points, it's exactly the same 1.00. So that's why, you know, the, you can say velocity of, you know, uh, of the of light in air is also same as C because we don't really need to go beyond, let's say two decimal points, okay. But then this index of refraction can change, let's say if, if it's water, because in water it's significantly changes its speed. And if I calculate, I'm gonna get 1.33 for the index of refraction for water. And that's already significant. That means the light basically decreases by about 30%. So that's already you know significant decrease. It's still moving really, really fast. Let's say two, some, two point something times 10 to the eight meter per second, but still it's a significant decrease that we can actually you know see the effects of that. All right. So before we get to that, um, there are other things we can talk about, which is, okay, so what is a wave? Well, wave is, you know, disturbance in a medium, or, you know, now we know that you don't need a medium for it with electromagnetic waves. It's some kind of disturbance that generates electric and magnetic fields, changing electric and magnetic fields, and they're propagating in, you know, free space and reinforce each other. But what do they, you know, move from point A to point B? Well, remember, they move energy. Okay, energy is what is being moved by a wave. And then we have an equation. So you have um, this U, which is energy density, means this is energy in a, you know, well, let me do this. Um, I'm not gonna use the E for the energy because we have then E for the electric field. Let me do it like this. Um, I'm gonna use, let's say U for energy. Okay, so this is lowercase u, this is uppercase u per unit volume. Okay, so uh, like that. Or maybe, you know, let's just go ahead and do, the, do this. So it's energy per volume. So now there's an energy associated inside the electric field plus energy in the magnetic fields because you can store energy here and there, right? And that means this is the energy per unit volume. That means, you know, let's say, if you consider this volume where the those fields are moving, right? Let's say propagating like this here. So then how much energy in that volume of space? Well, these are, you know, known as energy densities. You can see, right, then uh, energy density for um, electric field. So is, well, let me do it like this. So the, energy like energy for the electric field is then one half 
epsilon naught electric field magnitude square. Electric field for magnetic field is one half and mu naught then B square. You can see, right, one is in terms of electric field amplitude, the other one is magnetic field. So you can kind of, you know, use this and when you combine together, one thing we can do here is, since electric field and magnetic fields are related to one another, so then we can use those um, to kind of um, substitute electric field or magnetic field and have an equation for density just in terms of electric field or um, just in terms of magnetic field, which actually, you know, this equation over here. So this equation just in terms of just electric field and the same way you can do it with, with just magnetic field, All right? But one thing we kind of, you know, might uh, use is the intensity, average volume. So that we call this um, pointing vector. So this S represents the, you know, let's say the inten average intensity, or you know, average average value of this S represents the intensity. So again, this represents you know how much. So if you have a solar panel, right, and then you have the area through that solar panel. So how much energy is absorbed in that solar panel of that area A as a function of time? Okay. So then you have then these equations again. So these are just equations which is basically represents you know energy, right, associated you know. With, with that particular, let's say, solar panel. And um, you can see, right, this is nothing but uh, energy density that we had the equation in previous chapter, previous slide, right, times the speed of light. That means the easiest way is just basically to do that, or, you know, maybe this equation, magnitude of electric field times magnitude of the magnetic field divided by the, you know, magnetic constant, okay? And similar way, you can see, right, there's an average of the, uh, this, you know, this S, right, intensity, which is E max times B max, which is the amplitudes, divided by two times mu naught, which is then the magnetic constant. All right, so again, so kind of like some equations over here that, you know, um, let's say taking the average, you know, energy density times the speed of light gives you the average, you know, this S. So this, this S again is, you know, we don't really use it in this class, but it's a pointing vector. So it's known as a pointing vector. Okay. And then what we can do here, we can calculate then the intensity of the wave. That means how much energy, right? So average power per unit area in an electromagnetic wave. And you can see that, you know, you can just take the amplitudes, E max times B max, divided by two times the magnetic constant. It's relatively simple to calculate this. All right, so um, now we have uh, the microwave, you know, even though let's say um, I haven't used microwave in a while because, you know, I don't have it in my house anymore, but microwave is just a device that uses electromagnetic waves that have microwave, you know, let's say waves, right? Remember microwave is type of electromagnetic wave. And what we have here is, microwave basically generates electromagnetic waves. And electromagnetic waves, you know, this particular, right, have a wavelength of roughly about 12 centimeters. So then when you put your food inside the microwave, you're basically bombarding it with, you know, radiation. And the radiation is just basically electromagnetic wave. And what is, you know, electromagnetic wave? It's just energy, right? And that means you're providing energy to your food. And then your food, basically absorbs the energy in those electromagnetic waves. That means the water in your food absorbs it and it starts warming up and heating up. That means you heat up your food by having the water in your food absorb the energy from the electromagnetic waves. Okay. And another thing you have here is, so you also have to rotate otherwise so that, you know, every, everything is evenly distributed uh, because let's say, remember the electromagnetic waves uh, basically gives you sort of like nodes, right? So those are the nodes, right? So because it's that they kind of, you know, trapped, right? So you have those nodes. So those nodes provide no energy. So if you put your foot here, you're gonna have a warm area, cold area, warm area, cold area, right? So, but if you rotate your food, then it kind of gets evenly distributed. So, and you know, no problem with that. All right, so let's look at some examples here. 
So how much time does it take light to travel from the moon to the earth, a distance of 384 kilometers? And light from the star Sirius take 8.61 years to reach the earth. What is the distance to Sirius in kilometers? All right, so what we're given here is the, you know, good old speed equals distance over time equation, okay? So remember, speed equals distance over time, that equation. Well, part A is asking how much time? All right, time is then distance over the speed. Now, this is for the light, that means in vacuum. So it's gonna be then distance over the speed of light in vacuum. All right, so we take 384,000 kilometers, but remember kilometers is 10 to the three meters. Then this is divided by the speed of light in vacuum, three times 10 to the eight meter per second. Well, what we get here is 1.28 seconds. That means if somebody on the moon has a flashlight and turn on the flashlight, we will see the flashlight 1.28 seconds later because the light will travel, you know, uh, from, from the moon surface to us in 1.28 seconds, which is really, really fast. But that still, you know, it is finite. That means, for example, if you're considering the speed of light um, coming from, or the light coming from the sun, sun is much further. Well, it takes about eight minutes. So I think about eight minutes for it to arrive. All right. Part B, light from star series takes 8.61 years to reach the Earth. Well, in this case, we're given, still using the same equation, but we're given speed and time. So we want to find the distance. So this will be C times T. So three times 10 to the eight meter per second. But since there's a second, we need to make sure that time here is in seconds as well. So 8.61 years, then we have to convert that, okay? So there's the table, you know, tables that give you that one year is 3.156 times 10 to the seven seconds. Well, we calculate this and we get 8.15 times 10 to the 13 kilometers, All right? That means it's really far away. That means the light that leaves Sirius takes 8.61 years to reach us. So like right now, if the Sirius as a star exploded seven years ago, we would not know about it because the light still traveling us from the star that was still there, okay? Right, so there are two categories of ultraviolet light. Here's another example. So ultraviolet A, UVA, has a wavelength ranging from 320 nanometers to 400 nanometers. It is not so harmful to the skin and is necessary for the production of the vitamin D. Another ultraviolet, UVB, with a wavelength of 280 nanometers to 320 nanometers is much more dangerous because it can cause skin cancer. So we're just gonna find the frequency or and uh, frequency ranges of the UVA and UVB. And what are the ranges of the wave numbers for UVA and UVB? So let's do that. Then uh, what I have here is find the frequency. That means using this equation, V, which is now a C equals wavelength times frequency. So I can say, okay, so here's a frequency, which is equals to C over the wavelength. All right, so the range is basically like this, right? So we're gonna have to do, you know, uh, calculations for this. So, which is, you know, the speed of light divided by, you know, first wavelength, then speed of light divided by the second wavelength, right? To find its range. So let's say if I do that for UVA, what I get is this. So it's 7.5 times 10 to the 14 Hertz to 9.38 times 10 to the 14 Hertz. Okay. And then UVB ranges from 9.38 to 
times 10 to the 14 hertz to then 1.07 times 10 to the 15 hertz. Or you can see, right, you have much, you know, higher frequency. And if you remember, much higher frequency means much more, um, much more energy. So B is the wave numbers. So if you do the wave numbers, remember K is equals to two pi over the wave number, okay? So then we can calculate for UVA, the wave number, which is plug in, just calculate over there. We get 1.57 times 10 to the seven radians per meters. And then 1.96 times 10 to the seven radians per meters. Then you have UVB, which ranges from 1.96 times 10 to the seven radians per meters to 2.24 times 10 to the seven radians per meters. All right, so those are then the values. You can see, right, you know, it is more dangerous because it has much more frequency, much higher frequency. All right, so here's another example. A sinusoidal electromagnetic wave having a magnetic field of amplitude 1.25 microtesla and a wavelength of 4, 432 nanometers and is traveling in the x direction through empty space. What is the frequency of this wave and what is the amplitude of the associated electric field? Now write the equations for the electric and magnetic fields as a function of x and t in the form of equation 23.3, which is basically their general equations. All right. So now here's what we're given then. We are given amplitude of the magnetic field, but not the amplitude of the electric field. But the thing is, we know what is the amplitude of the magnetic field can be how the how can be used to find the amplitude of the electric field, all right? So what we can do here is, remember that equation C is equals to E max over B max. So I can use that to find electric field, you know, amplitude. But let's say for part A is asking, what is the frequency of this wave? All right, so, for part A, well, I have the wavelength and the speed. It's an electromagnetic wave. That means wavelength times frequency is the speed, then frequency is then speed over the wavelength. So speed over the wavelength. So three times 10 to the eight meter per second, over 432 times 10 to the negative nine meters. So we're gonna get 6.94 here. Um, so 6.94 times 10 to the 14 Hertz. All right. Part B, then I can start using this. So you can see then from here, I can find then E max from then C times B max. All right, so then take three times 10 to the eight meter per second times 1.25 times 10 to the negative six Tesla. And I'm gonna get 375 volts per meters. Part C. It says, find the period, which is one over the frequency. And this is equal to then 1.44 times 10 to the negative 15 seconds. All right, so now that I have all of those things, I can then go ahead and plug in. I can calculate this in terms of then E is equals to E max, then times cosine of, sine of, then what I get here is, remember is two pi over the period times T minus two pi over the wavelength times um, X, okay? So then you just plug in whatever we calculated for the period and whatever we 
have for the wavelength, right? And, or you can then use this equation for omega, which is two pi over the period, and a wave number, which is two pi over the, you know, let's say the wavelength, right? To substitute for that. So let's say if you calculate all of those things, then we can say that, for example, E is equals to, its amplitude is 375, then sine of um, 4.36 times 10 to the 15, which is the wave number times T, then minus 1.45 times 10 to the seven uh, times X. Okay, so that's basically my E. And then my B will be then uh, 1.25 times 10 to the negative six, which is the, in terms of its magnitude, amplitude, then times sine of 4.36 times 10 to the 15 times T, then minus 1.45 times 10 to the seven times X. And that's basically the equation for electric and magnetic.